So, hi, hi, abu. This is, this is baby Weston, Weston Major Paul. Thank you. He is the son of Landon and Ashley, and he's the grandchild of Diane and myself and Mark and Kim, great-grandchild of Donald and Carolyn, and Major uh, Ruth uh, Pounders. And so today, uh, we are going to take an opportunity to dedicate Baby Weston. Um, when we had our children, uh, we promised God that if he would give us healthy children, that we would give them back to him. And so Landon, I remember when you were born, what a special time that was for us. It was a very wonderful time, and God blessed us with Landon. And actually, I remember your mom and dad speaking on many occasions how wonderfully blessed they were when you were born. And as you guys grew up, we began to pray for you, and not only specifically for you, but we began to pray for your futures too. We began to pray for your spouse that God would bring you. And we prayed specifically that he would bring you a wonderful, godly woman to be your wife. And actually, I'm sure your mom and dad prayed exactly the same thing for you. You had your heart set on exactly that, and that's what God provided. So today we're going to dedicate him in just a minute, but I'm going to give him back to you, Landon. Now I have some charges for you. I charge you, Landon and Ashley, to raise baby Weston in the fear and admonition of the Lord. I pray for you to, I, I, I charge you to pray for him daily, to lift up to God this fine baby that he has given you, so healthy and so full of personality. And I charge you to ask God to raise him up to be a mighty warrior of his word and to march forward in the ranks of all the Pauls that have gone back for generations proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. A congregation, I know they're not here very frequently, but I charge you to pray for them as they try to raise him the way that God would have them raise him. And if you will do that, will you please say amen? Right, Landon and Ashley, if you will receive your charge, will you please say amen? amen. All right, let's pray. Oh, Father God, how wonderfully blessed we are for you to have given us this wonderful grandchild, Weston Major Paul. Right now, we lift him up to you we pray your providential care over him his whole life. We pray your protection over him his whole life. We pray your favor over him his whole life. Right now, in the name of Jesus Christ, we bless him with your presence. And Father, I pray that you would raise him up to be a mighty warrior of your word going forward and carrying the gospel into this world around us. I pray, Father, that he would be a blessing to everyone that you bring across his path. I bless him right now that all days ahead would be filled with your presence. For it's in the precious, sweet name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, Yeshua, Messiah, that we pray. Amen. God's grace is a wonderful gift, but then when he extends his mercy, it's, it's, it's phenomenal. And his mercy comes in so many different ways, doesn't it? Yes, it does. You know, each of us are extremely different. None of us are made the same. 
Some of us are um, lighter colored skin, like Poppy and Keaton and myself. And I've had people before say, please pull your britches legs down, it's blinding me. And some of us have darker hair, some have lighter hair, some have no hair, some have lots of hair. Some of us are uh, thicker skinned and kind of run hot all year long regardless of the temperature and some of us are thinner skinned and we are cold even when it's 110 degrees outside, right? But we're all different, we're all different and God has given us each our own individual DNA and our own individual fingerprints. However, the fact of the matter remains that we are created in His image, in His likeness. So in a sense, although we're very, very different, we're also very much the same. There's a contributing writer to the New York Times. He was riding on a local public bus in Los Angeles. And he got on and he noticed that the normal chatter was rather low and the bus was particularly full. So he made his way to the back and he noticed that there was one seat available and no one was sitting in. And he got up to the seat and he looked and was immediately taken back. You see, the young man that was sitting there next to the window was grotesquely ugly. His face uh, deformed by um, all kinds of uh, tumors. And his hair was long and stringy and oily. His clothes were tattered and torn. You could tell that they were just absolutely worn out. He smelled just a little bit. Obviously, he was homeless. And this gentleman began to look and he realized that this fellow hadn't done anything wrong. The only wrong was that he was extremely unfortunate in life. So he sat down next to him. The young man never made eye contact, never looked at him at all. They went on down, and the next bus stop came, and some more people came on the bus, and there was one elderly lady that went to the back of the bus. Being a gentleman, this writer stood up, and he, he pointed down to the seat to say, please, take my seat. And very loudly she said, no, I don't want to sit next to that young man. Isn't that horrible? That's hard for me to hear. But folks, discrimination runs rampant in this world today. You can find it anywhere. Just about everywhere you go, there's some form of discrimination happening. And what would you say if I told you that it is even very prevalent in today's churches. I don't know if you individually have experienced it or not, but I have seen it pretty much my whole life where people will try to come in and mix and mingle with the church and the church won't let them. There was a, there was a middle-aged lady that wanted to come to a particular church that was close to her house and she came in and she was there for a little while and she thought, well, I'll just join the church. And, and so she went to the leadership and said, I'd like to join your church. And, and the senior pastor looked at her and said, okay, I'll tell you what, you go home this week and, and uh, you, you just give it some thought and, and come back next week and we'll talk more about it. So she did, she went home and she thought through it, decided, yeah, that's what I want to do. She came back and she talked to the senior pastor and said, yeah, that's what I want to do. And he said, well, all right, I'll tell you what. You go home this week and you read one verse uh, out of one chapter of your Bible this whole week 
Just kind of meditate on that scripture. You come back next Sunday and we'll talk about it again. And so she did that one week. She went home and she meditated on this particular scripture. And she came back the next Sunday and, and the pastor's like, you know what? I tell you what, this, this, is the, the, this week, go home and I just want you to spend time in prayer with God. Now ask him what he wants you to do, if he wants you to be a member of this church or not. And so she did, and, and um, the next week came and went. He didn't see her. The next went, week came and went. He didn't see her. About six months down the road, he was in the grocery store, and he came across this lady, and he said, I, I didn't see you come back. And she said, I didn't come back. He said, well, um, after your prayer time, uh, what did you come, what conclusion did you come to with God? And she said, God told me, look, don't worry about being a part of that church. I've been trying to get in there 20 years and still hadn't been able to. <laughs> so you see, discrimination runs rampant. It's everywhere. As a matter of fact, this is not something new. And particularly, James chapter 2, verses 1 through 13, which is where we're going to be today, James has to take this portion of his epistle just to address discrimination in the church. And he does it in a very phenomenal fashion that I want to share with you. He confronts it head on, and his focus in this particular section of Scripture is on the poor and the rich. But you have to understand it is the poor and the rich of his day, not the poor and the rich of our day. They're... Uh, they're a little bit different. But the principles that he brings to light are much, much broader in their application and what we need to do with them. Rick Warren suggests that there are at least five areas that we as believers fall into um, being tempted to discriminate. And, and give these a thought. Uh, he says we can discriminate on the basis of appearance. Uh, for a few moments, I thought about just uh, being totally rank and haggard and all kinds of things and coming in and preaching as that example. Uh, but then I decided against it because I was beginning to offend myself. And then Rick says that we can discriminate on the basis of ancestry. You know, oh, he, he is part of that family over there, and they've just, you know, they've been around forever and a day and all that kind of good stuff. And then we can discriminate on the basis of age. And you notice this all around you, that uh, sometimes the older you get, the harder it is to get jobs, and first one thing and another, because people do sincerely discriminate against age. And then there is the discrimination on the basis of achievement. Uh, you notice that whenever there are sports uh, uh, athletes that, that are just phenomenal and they've achieved a lot in life, that they uh, sometimes are able to discriminate against others and not even meaning to, and not even meaning to against achievement. It also happens um, in the business world whenever somebody, you know, on Wall Street climbs the ladder and begins to really see great wealth then people uh, allow discrimination to happen. And then uh, the last one that he talks about is discrimination on the basis of affluence, and that is somebody in your community, as an example, a judge or a lawyer or a doctor, somebody that, that carries a lot of influence uh, around with them to the community. So in this section, James is going to presenting be presenting some very, very compelling reasons why we should absolutely, totally reject any kind of discriminatory spirit in our churches. Let's look at the Scripture, beginning with James chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. James 2, 1 through 13. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, 
Has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. I've got a couple of points that I want to bring out to you today regarding discrimination in the church. And the first is this. The Christian faith as we have it, as we know it, has no place for social discrimination. Remember that James opens chapter 2 with a very pointed statement that he's going to use to kind of set up the rest of this particular section that's denouncing all kinds of discrimination. He says, My brother, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Again, just like chapter 1, we can see that James is again writing to his Christian brothers and his Christian sisters, those Jews that have been scattered. And they would have been very familiar with the writings of the Old Testament. Because you, you back in, in uh, Leviticus and, and Deuteronomy and Proverbs, there's all kinds of scriptures that tell us to not show partiality to the rich or the mighty or in judgment. And so in verse 1, James uses that word partiality, which literally means to receive a face. It's, it, it portrays, if you will, the undue favoritism that the folks in that church um, we're showing to the wealthy, to those people who seem to have um, resources, the wealthy visitors that were visiting the assembly. And then they were giving very little attention to the poor. And so according to James, he says that such conduct like this is actually dishonoring to the Lord. And who is um, uh, the person that comes in and shows favoritism is, is dishonoring the Lord in such a way that they're committing sin. And the Lord is not a respecter of persons. The Lord doesn't show partiality. So first of all, social discrimination is just totally incompatible with the Christian faith. There's no room for Christians to be showing prejudice or racial hatred or judgment. And so God only has one family right? He only has one family. And if we're in Christ, then we're all in that family. And we all have an equal status with God. Number two, the church's calling holds no room for social discrimination. Speaking of the church's calling, let's look at verses two through four. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? So here comes a man into the local assembly, right? He walks in. He's obviously a visitor because he doesn't know where to sit. He doesn't have a, a seat already that he's used to sitting in. And uh, he is noticed to be wearing golden rings and fine clothing. And so uh, one of the elders or one of the ushers, if you will, of that church comes over and, and kind of carries him over with royal treatment to one of the preferred areas of seating in the synagogue or in the, in the church. And shortly after he comes in, then a poor man comes in. And they just kind of shove him around, you know. Okay, you can either come over here and sit over here, or you can go there and sit on the floor. You know, just kind of push him off to the side. 
And so James's question to those showing favoritism is actually rhetorical in, in a sense. Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? And the only answer is yes, they have. Instead of being caught up then in the glory of the Lord, they were caught up in the, in the wealth or the, the fine clothing of this gentleman thinking that he was something that they needed to elevate to a special place. So when you look at it a little closer, it's, it's, in my opinion, a matter of the heart. You know? God has put me into a place to pray for people, to, to love on people, um, to, to help them as I can. And as he created this church, he created a church with people just like you. And I have always always said that if God sends us the poorest of poor, then we will minister to the poorest of poor. If he sends us people that need a place to stay, then we'll give them a place to stay. If he sends us people who have money, that's fine, but they get no special treatment. God has blessed them. And he has sent them here for a reason, and we're going to minister to them. But no differently than we would minister to anybody else. Instead of honoring Jesus, they were showing partiality to this rich guy and despising the poor. Number three, God's choices do not include social Discrimina discrimination. God's choices do not include social discrimination. Listen again to what James says in, in uh, verse 5. Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? So he's, he's quick to point out here that those people who are Rejecting the poor in favor of the rich are actually dishonoring the very people that God has singled out for special blessings. If you look back at the scriptures, you know that, that God has a special place in his heart for those who are poor and those who are humble. And the gospel has always made a strong appeal to those people. In fact, it's easier for somebody who is poor like that to receive the gospel than it is for somebody who is wealthy. And the scriptures tell us that time and time again. The wealthy person tries to, tries to do it within their own means, within their own strength, within their own finances and resources. But they can't. James really calls out the fact here that that those who have been rejected by the world are the very ones that God has chosen for blessings. And that is a serious offense whenever you look at it. And, 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 and once again, this is an opportunity for, for us to understand that in God's economy, everything is upside down. It, 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 sometimes you look at it and you think, well, well, why is it that way? It's because God has a purpose. He has a reason. And so if it's upside down in God's economy, then we shouldn't do it either. Number four, social discrimination makes absolutely no sense. It makes no sense. In verses 6 and 7 of chapter 2, James writes, But if you have dishonored the poor man, are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? So he's calling out the rich people. The, the rich class of his day, and he tells his brothers and sisters in Christ that are giving special treatment to this very class of people on Sunday, that on Monday through Saturday, they're going to abuse you. And so the first question he asks is, who is oppressing you? Remember that he's referring to the rich and the poor of his day and, and how they typically interact with each, with each other outside of the confines of the, of the synagogue. In James's day, 
the, the rich, especially in the Jewish communities, were very oppressive to the poor. They preyed upon the poor. They would take total advantage if they could at every turn. And so James says here, the first question, who's oppressing you? And then the second question he says is, who's dragging you into court? As if they weren't already rich enough, they would find ways to litigate some issue, carrying these poor people into court, getting more rich on the fact that the poor people couldn't, uh, couldn't afford to defend themselves. And so James is saying, who's dragging you into court? It's the very same people that, that you're clamoring toward on Sunday. Why would you show favoritism in the local church to people like that who's bringing you all kinds of grief? And then the third question that James asks is this, who blasphemes the noble name by which you are called? He's saying, why in the world would you honor somebody like that who even blasphemes the name of the very one whom the Christians love and serve. I find it very interesting, actually, even into today's time, in Christendom today, I find it interesting, and if you, if you watch closely, you can see this happening, and, and there's going to be some kind of coverage, you know there probably is, of how Christendom really does kind of elevate those people, even people who bash Christianity on Monday through Saturday, turn around and some pastor somewhere elevates those same people to some status. You know, the people who, who are supposed to love God with all their hearts and their soul and their mind and their strength, a person like that comes along and, and they have enough money or enough fame or, or, or enough affluence that they tolerate what they do. They tolerate it. And some of them even say that it's okay for them to go and do what they do. So the big question, the big bold letters, capital letters, big question highlighted with yellow. So why do they do that? Why, why do people in churches do that? Well, I believe in some cases it's because they may be afraid of them. They may be afraid of persecution. Some cases they may even be afraid of prosecution. I believe that it's also a reason that, that, the, that these types of people get tolerated is because some of, these, some of these churches believe that if they tolerate them that they can further their own agenda. And so they tolerate them. And I believe that, that some people even uh, find themselves in the, build, in the middle of a building program or needing some money, and, they, and, and this rich person comes along and, and says, oh, hey, I'll give you some money, you know. And, and, um, and so in, in order to get that money, they tolerate them. I think I told you one time about these two brothers that were just filthy rich. And one of them was on his deathbed, and so the brother goes to... The, the, the healthy brother goes to the pastor of this little church that they had visited once or twice and said, look, whenever he dies and you hold his funeral, I'll give you a million dollars for your building program if you, if you say he was a saint. The pastor thought about it and thought about it and thought about it and thought about it. He said, okay. So the day of the funeral, he stood up and he said, folks, you know this man. I don't have to say a whole lot about this man. But I can tell you this. Next to his brother, he was a saint. <laughs> so God provided a way. You know, so, so I, I, don't know, I, I don't know exactly every reason or, or every purpose behind, behind why churches tolerate these kinds of peoples, but they shouldn't. They shouldn't. Now, let me say this real quick. James is not saying that, that having some money is evil, okay? He's not saying that. Nor is he saying that, that we should favor the poor at the expense of the, uh, of the people who may have some resources. He's not saying that either. What he is saying is 
very specifically, don't have undue partiality with regard to those types of people. Number five, the character. The character of the law is against social discrimination. Let's look at verses 8 through 11. If you really fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he's, he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So James says that, that if you really fulfill the law, the, the law of loving your neighbor as yourself, which, which is also the law of the kingdom of God, which is also the law that, that Jesus himself stressed so much during his ministry here on this earth, if you really fulfill that law, then you're, you're doing pretty good. However, he says, if you show partiality at all, you're committing sin, and you're convicted by the law as transgressors. It's all the same law. The royal law is the whole law given by the king of the law. The, the, the law of loving your neighbor as your, yourself is part of the same law as, as condemning adultery, as condemning murder, and as condemning partiality. And so James says that if you fail at any one of these, you failed at all of it, and that you're committing sin. You've broken the law. Number six, and this is the final one. Social discrimination has no knowledge of the future judgment. I find it interesting how James folds this in verses 12 and 13. So... Speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So going back to James chapter 1 verse 25, and, and you'll remember this, it's talking about the law of liberty and, and, and uh, being doers of the word and not just hearers of the word. In other words, we should practice what we preach. We should do what we say that we are supposed to do. And we should be those who will extend mercy. Mercy to people who otherwise would not receive mercy. And then James talks about the day when we all will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, as a Christian, you, your salvation will not be in question. But what will be in question will be the good deeds that you have done that point people to our Savior and Lord. In his final words, James says very simply that mercy triumphs over judgment. I'm going to ask George to come on back up as we close. Over and over and over again so far, James keeps telling us that we should demonstrate the reality of our faith by the way we live out our lives. And, and our standard of judgment as Christians is the word of God. But it's not just a verse here or a verse there. It's not something that you pluck out of context. It is the, the, the word of God from front cover to back cover with the, the word of God um, shedding light on other scriptures to make known to us exactly what God expects of us. And, and if we're really sincerely saying that by God's grace we have been saved through faith, that's saying a lot. And God extends to us mercifully that free gift called grace. He, if he has extended that to us, then we need to extend mercy to other people. Let me leave you with this. There is no place in 
the church for a display of prejudice. There is no place in the church for a display of partiality. There is no place in the church for the display of discrimination of any kind toward others. There is but one church, and we as Christians are all children of God. He is our Heavenly Father. We are His children. He does not discriminate, nor should we. Let's bow our heads. Father God, we thank you for this section of Scripture today, so timely, needed for this day and age. We, we just thank you that you have opened up our hearts, and I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would allow this to go deep and, and that you would water it and nurture it. And, and tomorrow and the next day and the next day, whenever we're out away from this church building, or out away from this church family and we see discrimination and partiality happening, that we uh, try to our very best not allow it to succeed. More importantly, Father God, I pray that the world around us will see that we extend mercy to all people. Help us, Father, to represent you. Help us to um, show this community that you're not a person that discriminates, and we aren't either. Father God, right now we thank you for this day. We feel so blessed to have been here together with these people. I pray your blessings on them and your provision and your favor, anointing them. In Christ's name we pray, amen.